So let's um let's get started. I, I don't want to wait too long. It's it's nine o'clock, I think. Um, yeah, it's nine o'clock. So um, the the purpose of this meeting is is a a, a big book study, um, of, of the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, and I'm going to do this twice a week. I'm going to do it Tuesdays and I'm going to do it Saturdays. Um, and it's not like a book, a, a big book study that you're probably used to. Uh, I've been to big book studies and a lot of them are uh, kind of like um, born to, especially to like a newcomer's kind of like, what are we talking about? You know, and it's, it's a, it's a little bit different. Um, and what makes it different is um, I'm going to go through the book um, like I would with a with a, a sponsee. So we're talking about experiences. We're going to talk about um, the 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 history. We're going to talk about like a whole lot of different things um, in this meeting that that you wouldn't get. Like we got a big book study on, on Saturday nights uh, when when the corona isn't uh, taking control, and, and it's it's like standing room only in there. It's an amazing group and. Um, the main reason it's it's amazing is not me. Um, it's because of, of what God does in the group. Um, sorry, I'm going to get a lot lot of calls here in, in a second. Um, please don't text me. Um, cause it's like you're getting in the group. So first thing we're going to do is we're going to pray in and, and, uh, it's not like a formal prayer of the serenity prayer or the our father prayer. So if, if you can just join me for a second, um, and just, um, close your eyes for a second. And, um, father God, we ask that you can come into this group and come into this room, um, and fill us up, fill me up, um, open our eyes and our hearts and our ears. And allow us to see you and not me. Keep my mouth open or keep my mouth shut and open your mouth up. I don't want to say anything. Use me to do your work and allow us to uh, be conscious of you and build a relationship with you through this work and through this book. Amen. Um, so I had a long, a, a long, a long, a long day. Um, I'm currently at work, and uh, the boys are, are there. I work at a, um, a, a facility with some boys who are amazing. And um, on my way to work, I uh, got some information about my brother um, who who isn't doing too well, one of my oldest brothers. Um, and he's not doing well right now um, through, through, this, through alcoholism and stuff like that. And it was some disturbing information. And, like, you got your mom... You know, kind of like on the verge of tears, you know, not knowing what to do and asking how I did it and stuff like that. And then um, that was at four o'clock. I'm coming into work and I had a, a call with my mother and then I get into work and about an hour in, uh, I get a phone call from a friend of mine. Um, and a lot of a lot of people m may be disturbed by this information, especially those of you who are in Florida um, but I got some information that like, man, I just lost like, man, I just lost like my brother, man. Like, uh, so, um, you know, good friend, Brian Beatty, um, passed away today about four o'clock and, uh, just tough, you know, and then talking to his father or his, his brother, excuse me. And, um. Just disturbing information. You got a guy who I'm honored to know who just presented me with my three years and gave me a buffalo nickel um, and talked to me about like uh, that's what Bill Wilson used to to use in the phone booth to call other alcoholics at the rehabs and the, and the uh, sanitariums and stuff like that to try to help another alcoholic. So uh, it's 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 been a a, tr a trying day, man, and um, in honor of Brian. Uh, we're going to do this work, and me and Brian used to do this work together, and we and and we had a big book study up in in uh in Stewart, and, and uh or or and, and we used to do this work there, you know. So it's it's uh 
it was a gift and an honor to know him and to be a part of his life. Um, and, and just amazing thing that man helped so many people. So in honor of Brian, man, just, uh, you know, pray for him and his family. So the first thing I would do with a sponsee was I would, I would ask them, hey, man, so are you willing to go any length? And they would ask, and of course, most people would say, yes, I'm willing to go to any length. I'll do whatever it takes. And then when you describe what any length looks like, it becomes a little bit different. And then the people that call you back, because it's like, I'll explain what any length is. Like, we'll break down the steps and we're going to talk about the mental and the physical part of it. And, and you know, in the spiritual part of the first step and how, like, I got this this thing that tells me I don't got it. And the only way to, to understand it, I, I'm the only one that can say that I got it. So I got a disease that tells me I don't got it, but I'm the only one that can say that I got it. So it's like we're in a tough spot. You know, we break down like how no human power can help me. So then we go through that. And then we go through the third step and I talk about what inventory looks like and what it means. And I break down all 12 steps and we're talking about service work and sponsorship and uh, you're going to help other people. We're going to to uh, to have a home group and be a member of that group and all that stuff. And um, the cool thing is like a lot of people will call you back and some some won't. And then if they do call me back, I would tell them to do the first eight pages of Bill's story. And I would say go through the first eight pages of Bill's story and highlight everything you relate to about how Bill felt, thought, and drank. And I've had numerous people who I got into with, with like I, I would get to them and meet with them after they did Bill's story and it would have like two or three things highlighted and and, and the sponsorship family that, that I was uh in before this it was it was kind of funny because like uh we would say if, if if you go through Bill's story the first eight pages and you got like two or three things highlighted um then you might not be one of us you know, you might like just need some therapy or like change your friends or like move away or something, you know. But if your book looks like my book and like everything's highlighted because how he thought, felt and drank. Because the truth is, I don't know anything about 1934 and I don't know anything about being, a, well, a little bit about being a stockbroker. But I don't know. I have no, that wasn't my trade. But how he thought and felt like, uh, for instance, um, how I, I get into... Um, <laughs> Financial leaders were my heroes, right? And, and business leaders were my heroes. And for me, that meant like the neighborhood drug dealers and, and the gangsters were my heroes. That's who I looked up to. And it was great uh, moments, sublime, intervals, hilarious and stuff like that. And I'm looking at like how I hung out with my older brother and how my older brother and them, I wanted to be with them and we had fun and it was like a party scene and I just wanted to be with the older guys and it was like cool and then like we got in a fight so there was war moments sublime and intervals hilarious we laughed and all that stuff and then after we went through Bill's story and they, and they had a whole bunch of stuff highlighted yes you know let's go through with the work so the first thing we do and I said I'll start from the blank page and the first thing I do is I write my name my sobriety date which is 21317 and my phone number and I put this is my book please return because I'd leave everything everywhere. And then on the next page and if you have a, a if you have a hardback copy you got a, a blank page and I love the hardback copies because the blank page is amazing and that's what I want to know about the book every time I open it. Nothing. I don't know anything. I'm not like a big book specialist. Um, uh, uh, I just do this work and I do what God wants me to do. And I try to do carry God's message into my fellow man and do and, and carry God into all my affairs. That's just what the deal, deal is with me. So on the next page, it says Alcoholics Anonymous. And what we do is write in, in my lineage of sponsorship. We write um, the it's called the 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 um, the set aside prayer. And it says, God, please set aside everything I think I know about the 12 steps, staying sober and everything that I think I know about you so that I may have a brand new experience with these things and especially with you. So then we go on to the next page and then the next page is talking about Alcoholics Anonymous. And for some reason, back in the day, they took out the symbol and the symbol was like a, 
a universal symbol, so they took it out for whatever reason, and the symbol is, our symbol is important. That is our spiritual toolkit. You got body, unity, spirit, service, mind, and recovery, and like the, the body and unity is like the physical side of things. Am I going to meetings? Am I, uh, am I talking to people? Am I part of the fellowship? Am I conversating afterwards? Am I fellowshipping with people? Spirit and service is carrying a message. It could also mean prayer and meditation. Am I doing those things? And then you got uh, Mind and Recovery, which is the textbooks of Alcoholics Anonymous. Am I doing this work? Am I reading the book? Am I going through the work with my sponsor? You know, are, are, are these things happening in my life? And if I'm feeling off or having an off day and feeling angry, then usually one of the legs in a triangle in the center of the circle is missing. I'm either not going to meetings, I'm not in service, or I'm not uh, learning or carrying the message, you know. Um, as we move on, and on the outside of the circle is, is the feeling of being whole, which is what Bob, uh, Bill and Bob describe as the uh, fourth dimension of existence. Table of contents, doctor's opinion is talking about the problem. This is what we're going to talk about. The problem, the first 45 pages and 55 pages, including the doctor's opinion, is about the first step. It's very important information. You know, so then we got Bill's story is to, and, and doctor's opinion is describing the problem. Uh, Bill's story through more about alcoholism is talking about the solution. We agnostics is help with the solution. Five, six, and seven, which is how it works in the action and working with others is a program of action to arrive at a relationship with God, which is what we're looking for. And then eight through 11 is like the advanced chapters. You got to the wise, the family afterwards, to the employers and a vision for you. At the bottom of the page, and hopefully you got this book too, and some people got the book without the stories. But in part one of the stories is the pioneers at AA. It's about the first 100 people. So the first 100 people that stayed sober, that's what those stories are about. They rarely change. They don't really change those stories. And then it, on a couple pages over in the context, you got part two of the stories. Part two of the stories is they stopped in time. Those stories are kind of about like people who, uh, who still got families, wives, kids, and, and the rooms are packed with them. It doesn't matter what you lost or anything because I know people that are just like me had the same thing that I got and they, they didn't have to lose everything. I know people who had great upbringings, great families, came from money, nothing wrong in their life. They're employed, got great jobs, everything, but they got the same thing I got. They pick up one and cannot put it down. And that's what those stories are about, are them guys. And then you got part three of the stories, low bottom cases, <laughs> lost nearly all. Um, me, that's me. Um, people who lost everything, uh, uh, the, the doctor's opinion, as we're, we're, we'll get into, the doctor's opinion is, is talking, of, he has a couple uh, experiences with guys like that in the back of the, in, in the, bot, in the, um, the end of the doctor's opinion, which is pretty cool. So then we go to the preface. Uh, at the top of the preface, I write textbook, and the definition of a textbook is a book designed to transmit information, assuming the reader knows nothing about the subject. So it's a textbook. So in other words, if we go to school and um, the <laughs> a trigonometry teacher comes and gives you a book and says, here, here's a book on trigonometry, and then he says, we're going to have a quiz tomorrow, so read the book. We're going to be lost. I know I'll be lost. I know nothing about math or trigonometry or any of that stuff. So I'll be lost. But when I have a teacher who goes through the book with me, who goes through the different series and, and the, uh, the studies of it, and, and we break it down throughout the marking period and stuff like that, by the end of the marking period, I'm pretty good with trigonometry. So this is the fourth edition and we're in the preface. This is the fourth edition of the book Alcoholics Anonymous. The first edition appeared in April of 1939. It's an important date. And in the following 16 years, more than 300,000 copies went into circulation. And the second edition, published in 1955, reached a total of more than 1,150,500 copies. The third edition came off the press in 1976, 21 years later, achieved a circulation of approximately almost 20 million. And I can't tell you what it is today. Um, I'm pretty sure it's pretty, pretty huge. 
So I'm a prison inmate. I've been I've been an uh, uh, inmate most of my life. Um, I was an inmate for a long time, and I read books in there. It's like the only thing you have to do when you're on lockdown. And like let, I'll tell you my favorite book, Dean Koontz. Dean, or let's let's even go to James Patterson, The Beach House. Right, it was like my favorite book. And I read James Patterson, The Beach House, and I can tell you that 16 years after that book came out. There wasn't that big of a, a jump in the sales. It sold a lot less than it sold in the beginning. And then 21 years after that, people were buying that thing on Amazon or getting it used or were grabbing it from somebody else. The fact is this book continues to build and grow and that means that there's something about it. Things that don't work don't grow. You know, that's just the facts of the matter. Any, any... Even in, in science and, 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 uh, and, and medicine, if something doesn't work, they get something that does. And if that don't work, it falls off the scene too. This has never fell off the scene, which means it's probably pretty important and it works for people. You got millions and millions and millions of people who it's worked for and I'm one of them. Because this book has become the basic text, there it is, a textbook for our society and has helped such a large numbers of alcoholic men and women to recover, there exists strong sentiment against any radical changes being made in it. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. Therefore, the first portion of this volume describing the AA recovery program has been left largely untouched in the course of revisions made for the second, third, and fourth editions. The section called The Doctor's Opinion has been kept intact as it was originally written in 1939 by the late William Silkworth, our society's great medical benefactor. We'll be getting into him in, in some pages to come. The second printed in the first edition added the appendix, Spiritual Experiences, um, AA Traditions, Medical View, Religious View, AA Lasker Award, and information on how to contact the AA groups. They were all added to the appendix and the Alcohol Foundation was discontinued. But the chief change was in the section of the personal stories, which is expanded to reflect the fellowship's growth. It's telling us why we have different editions of the book. The first 164 pages are not touched. So when they come out with different editions of the book, the first, second, third, and fourth edition, they, they didn't touch the work. They might touch the stories, but not the work. So it's all to uh, show the re reflection and, and the fellowship's growth. Bill's story, Doctors of Bob's Nightmare, and the other personal story from the first edition were retained intact. Three were edited and one was retitled. New versions of stories were written with all titles 30 completely new stories were added. And the story section was divided into three parts. And those three parts we just described. You got Lost Nearly All, the first 100, and um, um, Stopped in Time. And we explain what those were about, so we'll continue. This fourth edition includes the 12 concepts. The world, service, the world service and revised the three sections of personal stories as follows. One new story was added. So they're breaking down the stories and, and why they, they put them in there. When they change the stories in the book, it, all the stories are about one thing, not about how people got sober. All 42 personal stories in this book are about how people found that power. That's what the stories are about. It's an amazing thing. So you can read and get different people's conceptions of God and how they came into contact with that power and stuff like that. So, but that's what all the stories were changed for. And they also get changed because they want to show that this thing, they modernize the book. They want to show you that this thing still works today. All changes over, we're down to the last paragraph. All changes were made over the years of the big book have had the same purpose, to represent the current membership of Alcoholics Anonymous more accurately, and thereby to reach more people, to reach more people like us. If you have a drinking problem, we hope that you may pause and read in one of the 42 personal stories and think, yes, that has happened to me, or more important, yes, I felt like that too, or most important, we believe that this program can work for me. Forward to the first edition. And we're only going to go to, through two forwards before we get to the doctor's opinion. The first forward. This is how it was originally written in 1939. 
We have Alcoholics Anonymous are more than 100 men and women who have recovered from a seemingly hopeless state of mind and body to show other alcoholics precisely exactly how we have recovered is the main purpose of this book. So it, it, right there I underline that because it describes exactly what this book is about. It gives me the main purpose of this book right here. That it's it's going to show us exactly how we have recovered precisely. For them, we hope that these pages will prove so convincing that no further authentication, no further proof will be necessary. We think this account of our experiences will help everyone to better understand the alcoholic. Many do not comprehend that the alcoholic is a very sick person. And besides, we are sure that our way of living has its advantages for all, for everybody. You can give this thing to the judge. You can give it to mom. You can give it to the wife. You can give it to anybody and it help anybody understand us better and also understand that this thing is a disease. It is important that we remain anonymous because we are too few at present to handle the overwhelming number of personal appeals which may result from this publication. They wanted to remain anonymous where anonymity came from. They, they wanted to remain anonymous because there wasn't a lot of people there. You know, there was only a few people that was doing this work. This thing came from, you got different places it came from. You got uh, Washingtonians, you got uh, Oxford Group, and then Bill and them. And the fact of the matter is like, uh, if I found a cure for cancer right now, right? Say, say me and say you and, and us, all of us together come together in this little room that we're in and we have a cure for cancer. If we found a cure for cancer, a legitimate cure for cancer, and we went outside and said, hey, we got a cure for cancer, we would be bombarded. There, we wouldn't be going on with our normal lives. The news, the media, and everybody else would be at our house. Tell us how you did it and all that stuff. And our lives, our normal lives as we've seen them, would be over. And this time there was no, we're talking about 1939, there was, there was no solution to this problem. Now, the methods that they tried were a lot, a lot worse than the methods that they have now. You're talking about uh, electric shock therapy they tried. They tried uh, firing lines. They tried uh, um, um, lobotomies. None of it worked. So they didn't have a solution to the problem. So therefore, when they had a solution, everybody wanted it, as it's going to describe uh, here. So being mostly business or professional folk, we couldn't carry on with our occupation in such an event that everybody bombarded us. We would like it understood that our alcoholic work is an advocation. It's a, it's a minor hobby or occupation. We take people through the work in our spare time. We go to meetings in our spare time. We have some, some people who are, are fortunate enough, but we'll get into that. When writing or speaking publicly about alcoholism, we urge each of our fellowship to admit his personal name, designate himself as a member of Alcoholics Anonymous. Very earnestly, we ask the press also to observe this request, for otherwise we shall be greatly handicapped. Why is the saying we'll be greatly handicapped? Michael Jordan. Matter of fact, I'll give you a better example. I know all of you have seen uh, Malibu Passageways commercial. I was an addict for 10 years and now I'm not. <laughs> and a lot of you heard the same thing that I heard about that guy. Uh, he's no longer around. Um, he OD'd, some people say that things happened to him, but what do you think about his program now? His program. It, it's trash. If I put Michael Jordan up on the screen and Michael Jordan said, hi, I'm Michael Jordan and I'm an Alcoholics Anonymous, you know? And then everybody's like, oh snap, Mike did this. this, this works for Mike and we'd be telling each other like Mike did this too and this would be great and then everybody tries it, but what happens when Mike relapses? Everybody's going to say it don't work. You know, we are not an organization in any conventional sense of the word. There are no fees or dues whatsoever. The only requirement for membership is an honest desire. I underline that because in our third tradition, it says a desire to stop drinking or using whatever your twist is. Mine's everything. <laughs> um, but this says an honest desire. To stop drinking. This is how it was written in the beginning. We are not allied with any particular faith, sect, or denomination, nor are we opposed to anybody. We simply wish to be helpful to those who are afflicted. 
We shall be interested to hear from those who are getting results from this book, particularly from those who have commenced to work with other alcoholics, people who are taking other people through the work. Let us know how it works. We should like to be helpful in such cases. Inquiry by scientific, medical, and religious societies are welcomed as well. Forward to the second edition. This is so beautiful, man. There's so much information in just the, the forwards. Since the original forward to this book was written in 1939, a wholesale miracle has taken place. And that's what has happened. You went from 300,000 to like 1.2 uh, million. Our earliest printing voiced the hope that every alcoholic who journeys will find the fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous at his destination. Cool stuff. This is written in 1955, but just what they hoped happened. Anywhere you go, you'll find a 12-step fellowship and meeting somewhere. And most of the 12-step fellowships go through this book, you know. But it's amazing how, like, you can go anywhere and find A, A, N, A, whatever A uh, that you decide you can go to. It's, a, it's amazing. So already continues the, the early text twos and threes and fives has sprung up in our communities. Sixteen years have elapsed between our first printing of this book and the presentation in 1955 of our second edition. In that brief space, Alcoholics Anonymous has mushroomed into nearly 6,000 groups whose membership is far above 150,000 recovered, recovered alcoholics. Groups are to be found in each of the United States, Canada, flourishing communities, British Isles, Scandinavia, shout out to TJ, countries, South Africa, South America, Mexico, Alaska, Australia, and Hawaii. All told promising beginnings have been made in some 50 foreign countries and U.S. possessions. Some are just now taking shape in Asia. Many of our friends encourage us by saying that this is but a beginning, only an augury, which is like an omen, of a, a much larger future ahead. The spark that was the flare into the first AA group was struck in Akron, Ohio. This is really cool. In June of 1935, during a talk between a New York stockbroker, Bill Wilson, and an Akron physician who ended up being Dr. Bob. Six months earlier, which was December 11th, 1934, that's Bill's clean date, the broker had been relieved of this Drink obsession by a sudden spiritual experience. Following a meeting with an alcoholic friend, underlying alcoholic friend. Above alcoholic friend, write Ebby Thatcher, E-B-B-Y Thatcher. I don't know how to spell his name. This is all stuff that was presented to me. Words that I'm, I'm, I'm breaking down for you and stuff like that. I didn't know either. I had to look them up. I'm pretty much uh, retarded when it comes to words. Um, so the alcoholic friend, and we're going to, you wrote Ebby Thatcher, who had been in contact with the Oxford groups of that day, uh, top of the page, put reference to page 263. And the reason we're referring to 263, let's go to it. Let's go to page 263. <laughs> On page 263, you'll see six, one through six. You'll see the six steps of the Oxford group. So where this thing came from was the Oxford group. The Oxford group was like these um, religious, it was a religious program of action. Here's where, here were their steps. Number one, complete deflation. Number two, dependence and guidance from a higher power. Sounds familiar, right? Three, moral inventory. Four, confession. All this sounds very familiar. Five, restitution. And six, continue to work with other alcoholics. The only difference was the Oxford group wasn't just for alcoholics. If you go to, um, some of you have been, been to like uh, celebrate recovery and stuff like that. And that's kind of like a, it's like the closest thing that I can, uh, I can um, compare to the Oxford group. It's like you go there and you'll have people in there and they'll talk about like, um, hey man, uh, my name's Matt and I got a problem with depression, you know. And the Oxford group was just a religious program of action for all types of issues. So Ebby Thatcher came to the, and Ebby Thatcher, and the reason that I asked people to read the Bill's story before 
we do any of this stuff is because you'll learn who that dude, who alcoholic friend, Ebby Thatcher is the guy that showed up at Bill's door. Um, something about his eyes, something inexplicably different about my friend that was Ebby. So being as though Bill and Bob were like the, the, the founders of the 12-step fellowship, how did they get it? Ebby brought it to Bill. And of course, in the sixth step, continue to work with other alcoholics. Ebby knew what he had to do. That's why he showed up at Bill's house. He went to Bill's house because he knew Bill was a freaking struggling and hopeless variety alcoholic just like he was. So he wanted to go and be helpful to him. So following a meeting with an alcoholic friend who was Ebby Thatcher, we're back into the four to the second edition, who had been in contact with the Oxford groups of that day. He had also been greatly helped by the late Dr. William D. Silkworth, a New York specialist in alcoholism who is now counted no less than a medical saint by AA members. Thank God for Silkworth. And whose story in the early days of our society appears in the next pages, which is the doctor's opinion. From this doctor, the broker had learned the grave nature of alcoholism, the grave nature of alcoholism and drug addiction. You're hopeless. Doomed is what they'll tell you. Though he could not accept all the tenets of the Oxford groups, he was convinced the need of moral inventory, confessions of personality defects, restitution of those harms. We're talking about step work, help, helpfulness to others, and the necessity of belief, necessity of belief and, in, uh, and a dependence upon God. Upon God. Prior to his journey to Akron, <laughs> The broker had worked hard with many alcoholics on the theory that only an alcoholic could help another alcoholic. Bill was trying to do like the, the religious part of it. And um, thank God he only keep, uh, succeeded in keeping sober himself. The broker had gone to Akron on a business venture, which had collapsed, lost everything again, leaving him greatly in fear that he might start drinking again. He suddenly realized that in order to save himself, he must, that's a huge word, I get my guys to always uh, uh, underline must, carry his message to another alcoholic because that's what the sixth step told him to do. You got to help other people, man. That's what the Oxford group did too. The Oxford group, as you know, came, uh, Roland Hazard, another guy came to the, and, and got Ebby Thatcher out of, out of his commitment. He was about to be committed for alcoholic insanity, as you'll read in Bill's story. So he must carry the message to another alcoholic. That alcoholic turned out to be an Akron physician. <laughs> Thank God, because he's going to need him for what we're about to venture into. This physician, physician <laughs> had repeatedly tried spiritual means to resolve his alcoholic dilemma. Dilemma. Um, problem. My water bottle's empty. I fill it up. Problem solved. Dilemma. Two kids in the water, both are drowning, they're your kids, they're twins, pick one. Two equally unfavorable options, dilemma. <laughs> Accept spiritual help, go on best I can. They both suck, especially when you got a problem with God. So, but he had failed. When the broker gave him Dr. Silkworth's description of alcoholism and its hopelessness, the physician began to pursue the spiritual remedy for this malady with a willingness he had never before, before been able to muster. <laughs> so I, I'm assuming that, okay, in, in this time you had two different people that were like the, the, the alphas and the omegas. You had doctors and like clergymen, you know, priests and stuff like that. Like if you had an issue, you went to a doctor or a clergyman, or a priest, or whatever it was, you know, whatever the twist was then, religious twist. So people would go to those two people, and being as though he's a doctor, and you got this stockbroker, right, who comes up in there, and his stockbroker's trying to explain uh, the dilemma, and he's like, okay, well, I'm not, man, I'm a doctor. I know there's no hope for me. I've dealt with alcoholics, but I, I'm assuming that he probably was like, well, check Silkworth out and Dr. Silkworth was the doctor. So if you go to it, say you have a knee problem and you got to, you go to a knee specialist. And if you go to the knee specialist and you say, Hey man, who's the knee specialist? 
And they'll say, oh, that's Dr. Such and Such over in Europe or whatever the case may be. Dr. Silkworth was that dude. He was the dude that everybody knew. He was a very uh, prestigious man. Everybody knew his work. The little old doctor who loved alcoholics. He sobered never to drink again up to the moment of his death in 1950. This seemed to prove that one alcoholic could affect another as no non-alcoholic could. It also indicated that strenuous work, one alcoholic with another was vital to permanent recovery. <laughs> Hence the men set out to work almost frantically upon alcoholics arriving in the ward of Akron City Hospital. So I put on the top of my book there that they went out looking frantically for other alcoholics because they didn't want to drink again. And not only if you had, but if you had a spiritual experience and those of you that have had a spiritual experience or are looking for a spiritual experience, um, I just don't want to lose God. You know, I don't want to lose my connection to that power. And if they tell me that how I keep that connection is being in service and to help other people, that's what I'm going to do. So in fear of getting drunk, but also in fear of losing that power, which, of course, you're going to get drunk, right? Because that's what helps us, is, uh, is why they went to and, and worked frantically with other alcoholics. So they go to the ward. They go to the ward in, 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 uh, in Akron, Akron City Hospital. And uh, you had this lady named Sister Anisha. Some of you may be familiar with Sister Anisha. I think that's how you say it. Um, so... She's a she's a nurse slash nun at this place, and Bill approaches her like, "Hey, let us get you know." And, and this is kind of like my own twist on it. I, I can imagine that they went up in there and was like, "Hey, listen, lady, we need like a hopeless who, who's in here detoxing." And of course, every hospital had them back then. You know, no, there was no solution. There was no rehabs you can go to. You go to the sanitarium or the hospital, and uh, which is pretty much. What a lot of us do today. I've done it millions of times myself. I don't know about a million, but close. So you got this lady who goes up there and he's like, she's probably like, dude, I can't give you a patient. Imagine one of us going to a hospital and say, hey, uh, give us a patient. <laughs> They're going to call security and we're out of there. So, but he has a doctor with him. He has Dr. Bob with him. All God stuff that he helped, it just happened to be Dr. Bob. So he's probably, this is just how I can see things happening. It's like, he's probably like, listen, here's my credentials, lady. Um, this worked for me. So with some convincing, I guess they, they, they got her to clear out a closet and put a bed in it. And they gave her a case. They gave them a case. She gave them a case. His name was Bill Dobson. Bill Dobson comes in the room in the closet and they take him through the work, right? And what happens to him? Their very first case, a desperate one, <laughs> a desperate one, <laughs> recovered immediately and became AA number three. He never had another drink. This work, so <laughs> they did this work in that room. It's not, takes years to do. Um, or any of that stuff. I, I can actually, they got a lot more literature now and it breaks down a lot more parts of it. We can get the people that aren't in this super duper desperate position. I've seen a lot of people wake up um, that aren't in that position. So we got a lot of literature and even this doesn't take long. If you give me your time, I'll give you my time is how I work with my guys. He never had another drink. This work in Akron continued through the summer of 1935. There were many failures we all know if you're if you sponsor people, you know what they're talking about. Man, there were many failures, but there has been a, an occasional heartening success. So beautiful watching somebody's lights come on, man. But there was an occasional heartening success when the broker returned to New York in the fall of 1935. The first AA group had actually been formed, though no one had realized it at the time. They had a group, not a meeting, but a group, like. A home group. A home group is 
the home group members when we're talking about the newcomer before they come in and how we can be carrying the message and what we could do better for when they come in to make sure that they hear the message. Um, and then you got the meeting. It'll tell us about what a meeting is. So the second small group took shape in New York to be followed in 1937 with the start of a third in Cleveland. Besides these, there were scattered alcoholics who picked up the basic ideas in Akron, because after Bill Dobson recovered immediately, what she did was cleared out the whole war. And she had, and they were just, and you talking about some service work. These people were in there taking people through the work. That's in crazy service work. So they're in there day by day, just taking people through the work. And some of the people picked up the basic ideas and went through that. And I know this stuff is a, a, a little bit boring, but it's important for further on in the story. So in 1937, uh, the numbers that uh, of having substantial sobriety time behind them was sufficient in 1937, so it's only two years, <laughs> behind them was sufficient to convince the membership that a new light had been entered into the dark world of the alcoholic. It is now time the struggling groups thought to place their message and unique experiences before the world. This determination bore fruit in the spring of 1939 by the publication of this book. <laughs> The membership that had reached about 100 men and women, the fledgling society is like a baby society, which had been nameless, now begun to be called Alcoholics Anonymous from the title of its own book. The flying blind period ended and AA entered a new phase of its pioneering time. With the appearances of this book, a great deal began to happen. Dr. Harry Emerson Fosdick, what a name, a noted clergyman, reviewed it with approval. That's important. Reason why is because like it's when a noted clergyman approves something, right, that there's no proof and nothing else works for, other people want to try it. Reviewed it with approval. In the fall of 1939, Fulton Ulcer, however you say his name, the, liber uh, the editor of Liberty uh, printed a piece in his magazine called Alcoholics and God. So with that, it brought a rush of 800 frantic inquiries because people wanted to know how they were staying sober. What are you talking about? There is, I've been to the hospital and the sanitarium. It didn't work, you know? I tried medication. I tried lobotomies and electric shock therapy. That didn't work for me. So of course people wanted to know that there was uh, something that worked. <laughs> 800 frantic inquiries into the little New York office. You talking about some service work, man. These were, they, they, each inquiry was painstakingly answered. They answered all of them. Pamphlets and books were sent out. Businessmen traveling out of existing groups were referred to these prospective newcomers. Yo, Johnny, uh, I need you to go to Ohio, man, and, and help these people start this group. It was cool. I mean, amazing stuff. New groups started up, and it was found to the astonish, astonishment of everyone that AA's message could be transmitted in the mail as well as by word of mouth. By the end of 1939, it was estimated that 800 alcoholics were on their way to recovery. In the spring of 1940, John D. Rockefeller, um, Jay-Z Records, uh, Rockefeller Records, Jay-Z's uh, company, named his company after Rockefeller. Rockefeller was like Bill Gates of his time, you know. So when someone like that talks about something like this, people listen. He gave a dinner for many of his friends to which he invited AA members to tell their stories. News of this got on the world wires, inquiries poured in again, and many people went to the bookstore to get the book Alcoholics Anonymous. By March of 1941, the membership is shot up to 2,000. Then Jack Alexander wrote a feature article in the Sunday Evening Post and placed such a compelling picture of AA before the general public that alcoholics in need of, of help really deluged us. By the, by the close of 1941, AA numbered 8,000 members. The mushrooming process was in full swing and AA had become a, a, a national institution. Rockefeller, they went to Rockefeller, and this is this is this this story and uh, of what has been told to me. You know, they went to help and they tried to get uh, some money from Rockefeller, which is you can Google it. You know, and um, un unbelievable God in the picture again, man. God is all through this thing if if you just read it and and understand some stuff and.
So you got this dude Rockefeller who's a money man. That's all he is about is money. He loves money, you know. And he sees something that he can capitalize on, obviously, you know. And they go to him and try to open up. And Bill and Bob wanted to get some money and open up AA hospitals. And Rockefeller, thank God, said, no, you need to make this thing altruistic. You got to give this away. A man who could have made who knows how much money off of this, you know, said you got to give it away. Thank God that God put it on his heart to do that. So our society then entered a fearsome and exciting adolescent period. So we went from a baby fledgling society to an adolescent period. Two years. The test that it faced was this. Could these large numbers of erstwhile erratic alcoholics successfully meet and work together? No. Have you ever been to have you have you ever been to area service? You know, um, it's it's nuts. You know, the people, we can't. This is just what it was. So um, imagine if there was no traditions. The test that it faced was this: Could the, could we work and uh, work together? No. Would there be quarrels over membership, leadership, and money? Of course there would. Would there be strivings for power and prestige? Yes, still is. Would there be schemes which would split AA apart? Yes, there would. Soon AA was beset, divided, by these very problems on every side and in every group. But out of this frightening and first disrupting experience, the conviction grew that AAs either had to hang together or die separately. We had to unify our fellowship or pass off the scene. As we discovered the principles by which the individual alcoholic could live, which is the steps, right? The spiritual principles. So we had the evolved principles by which the AA groups and AA as a whole could survive and function effectively. So even though, like, even if you go to Narcotics Anonymous and you go to this uh, NA meeting and they always read the, the 12 traditions and it says in the 12 traditions, the hard one experience of our predecessors. These are the predecessors. They're talking about AA, you know, how they formed the traditions. And the Oxford group didn't have that. The Washingtonians didn't have that. And they kind of fell off the scene. AA had developed traditions through a, a frightening and disturbing um, a lot of activity, but they, they did it. It was thought that no non-alcoholic man or woman could be excluded from our society that our leaders might serve and never govern. Sounds familiar, right? Sounds like traditions. The, that each group ought to be autonomous and there was no professional class of therapy. There were no fees or dues. Our expenses were being met by our own voluntary contributions. There was to be the least possible organization even in our service centers. Our public relations are based on attraction rather than promotion. It was decided that all members ought to be anonymous at the level of press, radio, TV, and films. And in no circumstances should we give endorsements, make alliances, or enter public controversies. This was the substance of AA's 12 traditions, which are stated full on page 561. Though none of these principles had force of rules or laws, they had become so widely accepted by 1950 that they were confirmed by our first international conference held in Cleveland. Today, the remarkable unity of AA is one of the greatest assets that our society has. Thank God for the traditions. While the internal difficulties of our adolescent period were being ironed out, public acceptance by AA grew by, grew by leaps and bounds. For this, there were two principal reasons. The large numbers of recoveries and reunited homes. I usually stop here and I take my guys outside of my house. If you go outside your house, right, and say, say we're, this is my home, and say you go outside of my home, my grass is sky high, right, it's a few feet high. There's trash all over the yard and all over my driveway. There's regular police attendance at my house. The police are there all the time. Um, I go to the store, right? Um, I buy a crack pipe and a case of beer. Um, I go to work, if I ever have a job. I go to work, I'm never on time. I'm never performing my, my duties. I'm doing the least possible work as possible. And who sees that? Everybody sees that. My neighbors see it. 
The people driving by see it. The store clerk sees it. The owner of the store knows me by name. My boss sees it. All my co-workers sees it. Everybody sees it. How we grew was not by like me telling you, uh, my neighbor, right? I got, I, it's so cool. I got Cindy, who's my neighbor on the left. I got the, the, uh, the, the Vietnamese people across the street, the Haitian lady across the street, and I got Andrew on, on this side of me. And all those guys would see me. And it's cool. I have a relationship now. So I, if they came outside with regular police attendants, me beating on my wife and, and all this crazy stuff, always arguing and yelling or passed out drunk on my lawn or whatever the case may be, they would all see that. Everybody would see it. I couldn't say, hey, hey, Matt, how you doing today? Oh, I'm fine. And the same, nothing has changed. The cool thing is like all of a sudden they come home one day, my grass is cut, my weeds are trimmed, right? I got, I pulled the weeds. There's all the trash is picked up, right? There's no police attendants out front. I cut my, my neighbor's grass as well. I wave to the people across the street. I bring them mangoes, which I, I usually do, you know? I go to the store. I buy a Red Bull now. I go to work. I'm on time, usually. And um, I perform my duties, and I go uh, above and beyond if I can. I try to get not just my work done, but the shift that's coming in. I try to relieve stuff from their shift as well, you know? And who sees that? Everybody. It's a demonstration. No one, I don't have to go out and say, hey, yeah, I'm fine, you know, and nothing has changed. I don't even have to say anything. They see it. So when they see it, then all of a sudden they ask me. And like one of the neighbors might come up and say, hey, Matt, um, so what happened to you? And then I tell them. And then, and then all of a sudden they're saying, well, my husband has a problem. You think you can help? And I'm like, yeah, give him my number, you know? And it's amazing. So people see the demonstration in our lives and they watch what has happened and it has an effect on everyone in our community. I just got, ton, got, got done talking to one of the kids about this earlier, you know? My boy Gabe's in here, you know? And I was telling him about the demonstration. Now, like, I don't even have to say anything. Everywhere I go, they call me Mr. Wonderful at, at, at the freaking Walgreens, you know? Every time I walk in, she goes, Mr. Wonderful's here. You know, and that's just so cool. Like I make them laugh and we have a relationship. I got a relationship with the cat and it ain't even my cat. It's the lady's cat next door and I feed her cat. He comes over, he meows over in my house and I got relationships with my plants. I water the plants, you know? It's amazing what has happened and people see it. It's a demonstration in my life. People are understanding what's going on. They're watching it happen. That's how this fellowship grew. There wasn't no, oh, we got something that works. Take this medication. People seen the demonstration in people's lives. They seen people recovered. They were watching them and they're like, oh my gosh, I want that too. How do I get that? That's why this thing grew like that. Because they seen it. They seen the works. They seen it. They watched it happen. They seen proof in our lives. The same person who was desperate, hopeless, who was stuck and no one had hope for it. They were like, this dude's going to die. Finally, is coming like to grips with itself and being an a active member in the community and in society is crazy. So these made their, impre their impressions everywhere. At work, at the store, at the, the neighbors, the people driving by, uh, everywhere. You know, freaking Walgreens. It made their impressions everywhere. Of alcoholics who came to A, and, and you'll hear this a lot, when you, especially when you're in rehab and stuff like that. You'll hear people, there's only, there's only, Three of y'all that are going to make it. Look to your left and look to your right. Somebody's not going to make it, right? And this is what the book says, and this is the truth of it. <laughs> These made their impressions everywhere of alcoholics who came to AA or whatever A, right? And really tried. 50% got sober at once. At once. Who really tried. <laughs> and they remained that way. 25% sobered after some relapses. So that's, we're working on 75% now. 
And those of the remainder who stayed on with AA showed improvement. Other thousands at first came to AA meetings and first decided they didn't want the program. This ain't for me, bro. But great numbers of these, about two out of three, we watch it all the time, especially if you got a home group and you're an active member of your home group. You watch people come in, you'll never see them again, and then all of a sudden, a year or so later, or even a couple months, or sometimes for me, like a couple days later, I'm back, I'm like, okay, I need this again. You know, I, this has to happen for me. So that really tried. You know, other thousands came to AA meetings and at first decided they didn't want the program, but great numbers of these, about two or three, began to return as time passed. You're talking about in the 80%. So much for that, like, look to your left, look to your right. People are going to die. Someone's not going to make it, you know, rehab stuff. Like, this thing is for real. This thing has worked. And every staff member of this facility, it has worked or has contributed bare minimum to their lives. Everybody here, the kids that are here, it is bare minimum helping them or at least giving them an avenue so when they do leave here, they'll have somewhere to go. They'll know what is successful after they try so many other things and become unsuccessful at that. Another reason for the wide acceptance of AA was the administration of friends, the people, the clergymen, the, 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 uh, the innumerable people in medicine and religion and the press Together, like freaking uh, 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 Liberty Magazine and freaking John D. Rockefeller and all them stuff, all them people, you know, together with new innumerable others who became able and persistent advocates of us. Without such support, AA could have mo- made only s- the slowest progress. Some of the recommendation of AA's early medical and religious friends will be found further on in this book. Alcoholics Anonymous is not a religious organization. Neither does AA take any particular medical point of view, though we cooperate widely with the men of medicine as well as with the men of religion. Oxford group were soapbox preachers standing on, Jesus is the way. Jesus, it was a religious program. Although they had steps, it was a program of action. They were a religious program. When they, they were like, yo, are you willing to accept Jesus? Bon, cool, then you can come with us, you know? If not, uh, cool. So this thing came from, it, it being I'm just being real, I'm just telling the truth. This, came, this thing came from some Bible-talking Christians, you know? Is how the, the, the big book, well, the step process came about. And they got it all from the Bible, you know? A lot of, all the steps, if you go, if you've ever been to a, a uh, celebrate recovery meeting, they'll show you where the steps came from as they read off the steps. It's pretty cool, man. And rather you believe that or not, doesn't make a di- it doesn't make a difference. It's a program of action that works, man. And it's a spiritual program of action. So Alcoholics Anonymous is not a religious organization. Neither does AA take any particular medical point of view, though we cooperate widely with the men of medicine as well as with the men of religion. We cooperate widely with them. Alcohol being no respecter of persons, we are an accurate cross-section of America and in distant lands. The same democratic evening up process is now going on. By personal religious affiliations, we include everybody. Everybody. More than 50% of, 15% of us are women. It's a lot bigger now. At present, our membership is pyramiding at the rate of about 40% or excuse me, 20% a year. So far upon the total problem, and I don't know what that it is now. This is before 1955. So upon the total problem of several million actual or potential alcoholics in the world, we have made only a scratch in all probability. We shall never be able to touch more than a fair fraction of the alcohol problem and its ramifications. Upon therapy for the alcoholic himself, We surely have no monopoly, yet it is our great hope that all those who have as yet found no answer may begin to find one in the pages of this book and will presently join us on the high road to a new freedom. So it's 10, right? Um, We're going to skip over the the third and the fourth edition. We'll we'll end it here. Um, but the third and the fourth edition, I'll just break it down to you. Feel free, please read them, check them out. It's all great information, beautiful stuff. 
But it's basically talking about uh, the third and the, and, and the fourth are, are talking about how we broke this thing down into different uh, uh, languages and different countries and stuff like that. And it's, it's just showing the expansion of, of our fellowship. So Saturday, I'm doing this meeting Tuesdays and Saturdays at 8.30. Now we're about to embark on some really cool stuff. And I'll, I'll, I'll just share this with you before we go. The doctor's opinion. Dr. Silkworth, um, and I write this stuff on the top of the page. Dr. Silkworth was, uh, he, he, he went to uh, Princeton Bellevue Medical College, right? So, um, and they do clinicals. Um, if anybody knows a nurse or something like that, you'll understand what I'm talking about. Like they do clinicals, which is kind of like on the job training or at the hospital. So they do clinicals. When he was doing clinical, still in school, he worked with the inebriate and decided that that's what he wanted to do. So this guy has spent 50 years in the field, 20 plus years of education, trying to help us. Wasn't trying to solve his own problems. They called him the, the little old doctor who loved alcoholics. He worked with 40 to 50,000 people, was not a spiritual or religious person. Um, he worked at Towns Hospital. Towns Hospital was uh, like for the rich and famous. In New York City, Towns Hospital was like the hospital. He had lo Everybody lost stuff in the Great Depression. So Towns Hospital was kind of like... Um, the hospital, you know, it's like the doctor, the hospital. And he was the medical director of this hospital. So it's cool. We're getting all this information. This book breaks down everything from different. It gives you so many different points of views. It gives you points of views from people who aren't alcoholics, who studied in the field, who studied neurology and everything else to try to help us in the, and to save us and couldn't. They, they don't have an answer. They still don't today. But to have a doctor write this and admit <laughs> that there's nothing they can do is unbelievable. And the cool thing was like he wasn't trying to solve his own problem. This dude was just trying to help us, you know, and couldn't. So he gives us a great description. So we'll go over that Saturday um, and we'll, we'll get into Bill's story. So in the meantime, I encourage you to look at Bill's story, right? The first eight pages highlight or underline everything about how Bill thought, felt, and drank, how you relate to it, how he thought, felt, and drank. And then after you're done with the first eight pages, reread the whole story slowly because you're going to need the information. And you'll start to understand where the Oxford group, Ebby Thatcher, and all them came into play. So it's cool, and, and um, I'm glad you guys were with me. Um, it's, this thing is about to start to kick off now. You know, we're, we're past like the little born phase of trying to get through it as much as I can. Please pray for my friend and his family, man. Um, we just lost an amazing, honorable person, man. This dude is just full of love and light, man. And uh, I was honored to be his friend. Uh, he actually presented me with my three-year medallion, man. I'm, I'm just honored to, to have known him. And uh, uh, God bless y'all. I'll see y'all uh, Saturday, same time, 9 o'clock.